And good morning, everybody. Um, wanted to begin with something that I think should become uh, the tradition in my classes. I don't. I don't typically do it because um, my classes are usually later in the day, and we don't say the blessing for the Torah. So I want to do the blessing of the Torah uh, because it's morning, and it's usually part of our morning prayers, morning our shacharit prayer. So I'll begin, I'll say it in Hebrew, and then I'll translate it to English, and then I want to talk about it for a few minutes, and then we'll go into our topic. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidishanu b'mitzotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed be you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Hashem, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and in the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us, Know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Hashem, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. One more blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher bachar banu mikol haamim, v'nasan lonu is Torah so, baruch atah Adonai nusena Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. So my dear friends, welcome to this amazing uh, Sunday morning class. And we start with the blessing of the Torah. What is this blessing? What is this blessing that we pronounce and thank Hashem for every single morning, every single day for the Torah that he's given us? So the first thing is if we look at the first blessing, we said we said la sok, which means to immerse ourselves to engross ourselves in the Torah. It's a very interesting thing. We're thanking Hashem for giving us the commandment to engross ourselves in the Torah. What does it mean to engross ourselves? So we all know that there are many ways you can be involved in something. There's a way you can be involved in something where you're on the periphery. You're hearing a little bit. You learn a little bit. But the commandment with Torah is not that. The commandment with Torah is to be completely immersed in Torah. La asok, it's an esek. An esek means like a business. A business, you don't have someone who starts a, a business that uh, says, you know what, when I'm at the office, then I'm busy with the business. But when I'm home, I'm not. No. Someone who starts a business, they are completely consumed by that. They are, comp you know, they, they don't take off the sign, say, at a business when they leave. No, no, no. They're still in business. They may not be at the location, but they're still in business. A Jew, even when he's not studying Torah, needs to be immersed in Torah. You're not sitting in the study hall. You're not learning with the books open. That's fine. But you're still immersed in it. My grandfather would say, before you go out to the marketplace, before you leave uh, your home and you go on a trip, Open up a book of the Torah, open up a Mishnah, a Talmud, an idea, a concept. Don't let your mind be vacant. Don't let your mind uh, drift away. You know, even the radio, even the television, even the e XM radio and all of that nonsense that we, we can fill into our brains instead of us thinking creatively about words of Torah about our relationship, like you mentioned, Joe, you're thinking godliness while you're driving. That is the proper way. We should be completely consumed and immersed in the Torah. Okay, so that's the first blessing. But then we said, Hashem, please sweeten the words of Torah in our mouth. You know, Torah, our sages teach us, is a very incredible powerful tool and what we want from this Torah is to connect to the Almighty that's what we want ultimately Torah is a vessel through which we connect with the Almighty but we don't want that vessel to be with pain we don't want that vessel to be with 
too much difficulty. We want it to be sweet. Because what happens when a child eats something sweet? They come back, they say, I want some more. It was delicious, I want some more. And what we're asking for, we ask for this, is Hashem, make the words, make our experience a sweet one so that we come back and learn more. We want to connect more. Now, I remember when I was 15 years old, my rabbi brought something to our attention in yeshiva that really changed my perspective on prayer completely. He said, do you realize what you say in this prayer? You don't just pray for yourself that your Torah should be sweet, but you're praying for all your future generations. He says, you boys are 15 years old. You're not going to be married for a couple of years, a couple, three years. It's going to take some time till everyone gets married, until you have children. Start those prayers for your children, for your descendants now. That not only the Torah should be sweet for you, the Torah should be sweet for them and for their children and for their grandchildren and for their great-grandchildren and for all the children of the Jewish people. That sweetness should be alive in every single one of us every day. And then we conclude with one more blessing is that we recognize that we are the chosen people. As the chosen people, we have responsibilities. As the chosen people, the world looks to the Jewish people to be the light to the nations. And it's a responsibility that we have to reaffirm every day. Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, God chose us. We chose God, God chose us. And as such, we have a responsibility, not just to learn Torah, but to share the Torah that we learn with the world and to display ourselves properly, to be an example for the nations of the world. Because the nations of the world look to us as God's people. And if we are God's people, we need to display ourselves as such. We need to represent that relationship and not, God forbid, hide from it and not, God forbid, be a negative example of someone who is unscrupulous, someone who is unfaithful, or someone who is uh, untruthful. We have to be the example of what the Torah is. It's not enough to say, well, I could get away with it. That doesn't make a difference. You could get away with it. Does it mean that you should? Is that what God's people are here to represent? And that's what we pray and we say rem and remind ourselves every single day again and again. God chose us from all the nations and gave us the Torah as the light to show us the way. So that's a brief introduction to the prayer that we ask for Torah, for clarity, for sweetness, and for the responsibility that is the underpinning of the Jewish people. So I want to do with today something that I've never taught before. I've never taught this before. So I want to try and see if this would be a good, uh, a good something good for us to learn. I'll tell you why. I learned this with my study partner. We learn together every week. It's something which is completely new to my learning because it is an introduction to Hasidic wisdom. Now, typically, as you know, I teach a Musr study. We do the Musr master class and we talk through character traits. But this is something which is totally, totally different. And it opened my mind to a, a brand new perspective on Judaism, which I think is so special. I want to share it with everyone. So I'm going to be reading it uh, from the book, and I'll be translating it uh, paragraph by paragraph. So the first part of this is we need to understand. HaTorah HaKadoshah, the Holy Torah talks a lot. The Torah talks at great length about the pleasure, the word, magic word, pleasure in our service of Hashem. Now, many people think that pleasure is perhaps sinful. No, I can't get any pleasure out of this. It's not true. Like the Ramchal teaches us, Lutzato, 
in his writings. He says the person was created, Adam nivra lihitaneg al Hashem. To have pleasure. You know why you were brought to this world? Every single one of us were brought to this world? It might be shocking for some. We were brought to this world for pleasure. What type of pleasure? Now that's a conversation to have. Most people go for the lowest level pleasure. The simplest, quickest, most attainable pleasure. Cheap pleasure. Like food. Physical pleasures, those are easy ones. But what's about a pleasure that is above all pleasures? It's not going to be so easy. It's like, imagine, you can travel on a plane in many different ways. All right. Ultimately, we want to get to a destination. But there are different ways you can get there. You can take a horse and buggy. You can get into a car. You can get onto an airplane. Now, what's the difference? The difference is how fast you'll get there. Not only that, it's also the quality of the trip. Not only you can go by plane, but in the plane, there are many different ways you can travel. You can travel in the luggage department. You can travel with the cattle cart in economy. You can travel with the next level of economy plus. You can bring your handbag. You can breathe for free. And then you can go business class, you can go first class, and depending on the class that you choose is how much it will cost you. But we all realize when we recognize that there are different classes of how one can enjoy that, that transportation. The same thing in pleasures in this world, there are cheaper pleasures. And they're more expensive pleasures. Some are easy to attain and some are difficult to attain. But there's no question that the more difficult ones to attain are on a much higher level. So when we talk about Judaism, when we talk about Torah, what we see constantly as the theme is that there is an investment in pleasure. And let's talk about that. The Hilomerath, and this, and we see this many times in the Torah. Tamu Kitov Hashem. Taste it and you will see. Taste the Torah. And you will see how good Hashem is. You'll see the pleasure. Hashem. Then you will have pleasure with Hashem. Shimu Shamoa Elai Vachlutov. Vitisanag Bedeshanaf Shechem. We see all of these different uh, uh, um, terms of pleasure that we talk about in discussing our service of Hashem. And we ask for this pleasure every single day in what we just said, in the prayer that we just said. Please make it pleasant, make it enjoyable, make it pleasurable. For us to learn your Torah. We ask for that pleasure every single day. Okay, so we see that in the service of Hashem, we ask for pleasure. Pleasure is part and parcel of our service of Hashem. So, why? Why do we ask for pleasure? Because the power, the force of pleasure that God has given to mankind, who dover ikarim me'od ba'avadat Hashem is baruch, is a very integral and important part in our service for Hashem. So it's not pleasure, is not a sin. Pleasure is part and parcel, and it's a key, an essential part in our service to Hashem. Okay? So let's let's recap what we've said so far. In order to serve Hashem, we have to feel and have to desire to feel the pleasure that comes from that service of Hashem. And here's the shocking thing. To me, at least it was. This is what God desires. God wants us to enjoy the relationship we have with him. That we should have joy and we should have happiness and pleasure with the closeness that we have with God. 
and from the service of Hashem. I have heard all too many times people say, Rabbi, Shabbos is a great concept. It's a great idea. But I like to have fun with my family. I want to go to the beach with my family on Shabbos. That's my idea of enjoying my time with God. That could be. But if God prescribed a different type of pleasure, maybe you're missing out on something. Maybe you don't have the picture fully developed. Maybe. Because the level of pleasure that Hashem gives us, that the Almighty gives us in His Torah, is the highest form of pleasure. And only through pleasure is the proper service of Hashem. That means, if someone doesn't have pleasure in his service of Hashem, he's probably not serving Hashem properly. It's a bold statement. If someone doesn't experience pleasure in their service of Hashem, they're probably not serving Hashem properly. <laughs> Rabbi Brody was just here, Rabbi Laser Brody, he was in Houston a few weeks ago, and he said something really unique and special. He said, if someone doesn't smile, it's because they haven't talked to Hashem yet today. When you talk to Hashem, you have nothing to worry about. And therefore, you can smile. You can be happy. There's a pleasure in talking to God. There's a pleasure in feeling the confidence and knowing that Hashem is right there beside me. He's going to take care of all the issues. He's going to take care of all the hiccups in my life. Hashem is right there to take care of it. So I can smile. I can be carefree. I can be worry-free because I have nothing to worry about. God wants us to have pleasure in the service in our relationship with Him. And if a person doesn't have pleasure in the service of Hashem, and the person is doing his service of Hashem. Now, think of the service, think of a, a specific mitzvah, whether it be Shabbos, whether it be putting on tefillin or lighting Shabbos candles. So why do we do it? Are we doing it because I'm obligated to do it? We're doing it because I understand how this develops my relationship with God. Last night we did a beautiful mitzvah after uh, the evening service at the end of Shabbos. So we go at the beginning of a new month. We just started a new month on Wednesday, Thursday, the month of Tammuz. So there's a new moon. It's a mitzvah to say a prayer on the moon, on the new moon. So we go out Saturday night and we see, oh, what a beautiful moon. And we say a special prayer. We don't pray to the moon. We face Jerusalem. But we look at the moon and we say a certain prayer. What a beautiful mitzvah. But if someone doesn't understand the deeper meaning behind it, which I'm not going to get into now. If someone doesn't understand the deeper meaning behind it, it could feel like it's just a, an exercise of, I have to do this because God commanded me to do this. But if a person invests in the mitzvahs that we perform, if we invest in researching and understanding the deeper meanings behind it, so then the mitzvah becomes a joy. The mitzvah becomes a pleasure. The mitzvah becomes an act of love as opposed to an obligation. I have to do it. You do it not because it's a drag, because you're obligated by the Torah to do it. No, because it's a joy. Because it's a pleasure. So someone who only observes because he's obligated, but not because of pleasure. is compared to someone who received a special gift. You got a special gift. You got a brand new car. Not happy with the gift. Not happy. But you know why I'll drive this car? Just because you gave it to me. I'll do you a favor. That is equivalent of someone performing a mitzvah, not knowing why they're performing the mitzvah, not having any feeling or connection to the mitzvah, but observing it because God gave it to me. It's 
not a pleasant way for that gift to be used. You give someone a gift, you want them to enjoy it. You went out, you thought about it. You went, you did some research, you bought the best product, you gave it to them. And now they're doing you a favor, <laughs> right? You want them to enjoy it. You want them to, you want it to enhance their life. You want them to derive pleasure from it. Our sages teach us that the observance of the laws of the Torah needs work. It needs background. It needs us to put an effort forward to understand what it is that we're doing and do it with pleasure, with joy. Not only that it's embarrassing for the person who gives the gift, that now you're just, oh, okay, you gave me the gift, so I'll use it, fine. It's not a very good feeling. What really is going on here when someone receives a gift and they don't appreciate the gift is that they don't really know what they received. Anybody who received the gift has to understand what was the thought behind the gift? What was the feeling, the emotion, the connection of that person who gave us that gift? It's a sign. That gift is not just an object for us. That gift is a sign of a relationship. That gift is a sign of an affection that goes behind it. So when someone gives you a gift, you know what they're really doing? They're saying, I love you through this gift. Oh, that's a different gift. Now it's not about whether I like the car or I don't like the car. Now this represents a relationship. I tell young men who are about to get married, we do a whole series of classes before getting before there, before I, I officiate a wedding. So I talk to the young men, my wife learns with the young women, and we have I have a whole syllabus that I go through. <clears throat> and part of what I tell these young men, I say, your wife that you're about to, the, the woman you're about to marry is a very bright woman and she'll remember everything. She will, you know, they say to men, men should forget their mistakes because there's no use in two people remembering the same thing. Right? She'll remember your mistakes. It's fine. But there's one thing that she forgets. There's one thing that she forgets just about every 10 minutes. And you need to remind her again and again and again. And that is how much you love her. You have to remind her every 10 minutes how much you love her and say it verbally, say it with a gift, say it with a card, say it with her favorite chocolate bar or her ice cream. You say, you keep on saying and reminding her how much you love her. Because she forgets. That's the one area that she forgets, how much you love her. You know, there's a couple comes to a rabbi and they say, you know, we need to get divorced. So the guy's like, I don't know why you want to get divorced. It's, everything was great till now. Like what she says, look, we're married 15 years. You haven't said one time that I love you, that you love me. You said, you don't remember? I told you when we got married, I love you. And if anything changes, I'll let you know. All right? That doesn't work. She needs a constant reminder every few minutes, a reminder of the love. So I tell these young men, I said, not only get into the habit of saying I love you, I said, here's $50. Go to the nearest Walmart and go buy 50 cards. It's 94 cents a card with tax. It's a dollar. Go buy 50 cards. And every other day, every week, just write a little I love you card. And you can put one next to her bed. And you can put one next to the, uh, next to the uh, toothbrush. And you can put one in the refrigerator. You can put one. Just constantly remind her that you love her. Constantly. She needs a constant reminder. But what's behind that card? What's behind the flowers? What's behind the jewelry? It just represents 
the affection that we feel inside of us. It's an external representation of the internal feeling. That's what a gift is. The gift doesn't have to be something of value per se. It doesn't have to be, you know, men work in a very different wavelength. The men, it's about how much it costs. Oh, this is a nice watch. So she's off the hook now for a year or two years or three years because that watch was an expensive watch, right? It doesn't, how much does a card cost? 94 cents. But it's not about the cost. It's about the affection that's behind it. That's the most important part. And that's what people miss in relationships is the constant expression that is necessary to maintain a healthy relationship. This is what Hashem does for us all the time. Hashem gives us gifts every single minute of every single day. Small little gifts. Constantly. Hashem is constantly expressing that love. But do we take a moment to recognize and appreciate and love in return? And that's the mitzvahs that we have is the opportunity for us to reciprocate that love. Now, God, let's make it clear, as a disclaimer, God doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't need gifts. There's no gifts that God is lacking nothing. He doesn't need gifts. He doesn't need cards. He doesn't need I love you letters or chocolate. There's nothing that God is lacking. We can't provide anything for God. God is just there with open arms waiting for that relationship, for that embrace, if we choose to do so. That's our choice. We have free will, and we have the opportunity, if we decide to, to act on it. So, so imagine someone gives you a gift, and you don't even recognize the gift. You don't even realize that someone went out of their way wrote that card, bought those flowers, went out of their schedule, went out of their, their daily routine to express their love to you. You're not even happy. You don't even recognize it. So why do you drive this car now that you got as a gift? I'm just, I'll just do it to make you happy. Fine. Fine. I'll drive the car. Is that a pleasant feeling? That's not a pleasant feeling. Aside for the fact that this is embarrassing and humiliating for the person who gives the gift, even more so what it reveals, he doesn't even know. The recipient doesn't even know what they received. If you knew the thought, the effort that went into this gift, that this expresses, what does this gift express? It expresses an emotion, a gratitude. You miss the boat. You miss the boat if you if you only are enjoying this gift because someone gave it to you, but not realizing what's behind it. We say this in the Psalms. God says, you know what I gave you? I gave you goodness. A great inheritance I gave you. The Torah and the service of Hashem. They are sweet like honey and like a honeycomb. And if a person doesn't feel that sweetness, then whose mistake is it? Whose problem is it is if you, if you don't feel the sweetness of the Torah? If you don't feel the sweetness of the mitzvot? It's a flaw in the mitzvah or is it a flaw in us? Our sages teach us that we need to adapt ourselves to the sweetness of the Torah. The Torah gives us the guidelines. The Torah gives, again, remember this. God is the manufacturer. 
every single item that you buy, even this cup in the bag, right? There's a warning here. Caution, contents are hot. You know why? Because if you want to enjoy this cup, you have to know how to use it properly. Every book has an introduction telling the reader how to enjoy this book because typically people want to enjoy what it is that they're doing. If you're going to invest time in reading a book here, I'm going to give you the guidelines as the author how to enjoy this book, how to benefit from this book. A table, a chair, a light bulb, everything that you buy, anything that has been manufactured comes with a manual. You think about it, your cell phone comes with a 300 page manual, how to use it, how to turn it on, how to recharge it, and how to change the applications and how to download applications. Every single item that you buy, you go to Ikea and you buy a piece of furniture, it'll tell you exact instructions of how to enjoy that piece of furniture. Okay, so when a baby's born, where's the manual and how to raise this child? Where's the manual to how to give this child everything that it needs? Guess what? That's the Torah. The Torah is the manual for living. The Torah is the manual for a good marriage. The Torah is the manual for raising good children. The Torah is the manual for happiness. Everything you can possibly look for in life is in the Torah. Hashem is the creator of this universe, and He put His own user manual. But you say to yourself, I don't understand. To buy kosher? <laughs> It's expensive. So the greatest answer to that is a gift from Hashem. It's called Whole Foods. Right? To buy Whole Foods, to buy organic because some doctor said it's better for you. People are ready to spend $24 for a box of cereal. Because the doctor said, New York Times article a few years ago said, that they did hundreds of studies and they found no proven benefit to eating organic food. Not a single one. There's reasons to believe, but they couldn't find any proof. Hundreds of studies. And yet people are willing to pay a fortune of money for a, an assumption, for a hope that it's healthier. But God tells us to eat kosher food. I'm like, oh, it's a dollar more a pound for the meat. Forget it. Oh, so exorbitant. The greatest gift was whole foods. It showed that it depends on the motivation. It depends on the motivation. So, misuki midvash v'nofesupim. You know, there's an amazing thing. We talk about honey. Do you know the power of honey? A sages tell us something magnificent. A halacha says, Jewish law says, that if you take a nevela, something which isn't kosher, and you put it into honey, and it's there for an extended period of time, you can take it out and eat it after, after a certain amount of time. Why? Because the ingredients in the honey are so powerful that everything that's inside it becomes honey. I'm not talking about just the honey glazed. I'm talking about it just sits and is, is, is sitting in that honey for a long time. It becomes honey. Do you know it's an amazing thing? If someone goes to law school with a bad character trait, they're angry. What happens when they're finished law school? They're an angry lawyer. What happens if someone is a jealous person, goes into medical school? What happens when they leave medical school? They're a jealous doctor. Nothing changes in your traits. You may have gained more wisdom, but it doesn't transform who you are. But that's not the case when someone goes to learn Torah. That's why Torah is compared to honey. You can put someone with bad traits, they go into a yeshiva, they go into a study of Torah, they 
are completely consumed by Torah, you know what happens? They become Torah. They become sweet like the Torah. Torah has the power to transform a person completely, to eradicate, to remove their flaws, to remove their negative traits. It's all if we are able to immerse ourselves, like we said in the blessing, the introductory blessing to the Torah that we learned today. To, we want to be consumed by Torah. Like that honey. Because when we're consumed by Torah, what happens? We become honey. We become Torah. Those bad traits are pushed aside. Those bad traits are transformed. And we become better people because of it. That's what we pray for in our study for Torah. So here we're saying a very important first point, and that is pleasure. Pleasure is in the high in the eyes of the recipient. We are the recipients. We learn Hashem's Torah. If we don't feel the pleasure, we have to take a step back and evaluate why are we not enjoying this. If we perform a mitzvah and we don't enjoy that mitzvah, we have to take a step back and evaluate, why am I not enjoying this mitzvah? The more research we do on a mitzvah, the more background, the more study we do for a mitzvah, the more pleasurable it is. Because we understand it more. We understand what it is that we're doing. So if someone is doing a mitzvah of wearing tzitzit, wearing tzitzit every day, a four-cornered garment, right? We have the fringes, right? That are the corners of the four-corner garment. Why? Why? Why do we have such a mitzvah? Well, we can study that and we can learn and immerse ourselves in that Torah, in that study. And we have hundreds of books that discuss the mitzvahs. And you have a class here by Rabbi Yaakov Olbi every week. You discuss different mitzvahs. You see the brilliance, the perfection of this world that God put us into, that we can connect to God with every limb of our body, that we can connect to God in every moment of our lives and make it a pleasurable experience. So is it obligatory for us to enjoy, for us to have pleasure in our service of Hashem? Is it mandatory? So let's see. So. Till now we said, yes. Let's see further. Vihine, and behold, Milvaj Zochatanuk, who in Yan Ikari Mitsad Havoda, aside for that pleasure is an essential aspect of our service of Hashem. Sarikla Simlev, we have to pay attention, we have to notice Shatanuk Bavoda hi davar hechrechila nefesh. The nefesh, the soul, demands that we have pleasure from our service of Hashem. The oxygen for the soul is the pleasure we derive from the service of Hashem. Ki ha'amok biyoter the deepest need, the deepest calling of the soul, hu ha'tzorech ha'muchrach betanuk, is the need for pleasure. This is very tricky. Very tricky. Every single human being on planet Earth has a desire for pleasure. Right? Every person. Even people who are sadists, pain makes them feel pleasure. It's a whole different question. Why and how we can help them but every single human being seeks pleasure. That is what the soul desires. But we have to caution ourselves not to fall into the trap of cheap, fleeting, senseless pleasures, momentary pleasures. Umamela. So now this is a big danger, right? Now we're all desiring pleasure. Now we have to be careful. 
because I get derived great pleasure from good food and from a good drink and from a glass of wine. Good pleasure. Watching a good movie, perhaps. These are all cheap pleasures. What if that becomes the essence of what I of the pleasure I seek? And we're falling into a trap. If God forbid someone does not derive the proper pleasure in his service from Hashem, this is a grave, grave uh, um, danger. It'll become very, very difficult to overcome the Yetzahara. That will sell him false pleasures. False pleasures. Again, our soul has a desire, has a yearning for pleasure. And here, instead of giving it real, authentic pleasure, we're feeding it cheap, fake pleasure. How does that work? That's not good. Our, our soul gets disgusted by it. He says, instead of you giving me something real, here you're giving me fake stuff. Come on. Now, I just want to I want to just point something out before we continue here. And that is that when a person passes away from this world, we stand in front of the he- heavenly tribunal. We stand in front of the heavenly courts and we're asked a bunch of questions. Do you know what one of those questions are? It's shocking. One of those questions are, did you properly enjoy from this world? I gave you a world. I gave you the Swiss Alps. I gave you the Colorado Rockies. I gave you the incredible beauty of this world. Did you go enjoy it? Why why did I create it? I created it for you. Why did you go enjoy it? Why didn't you go to, to Arizona and see the beautiful creations? Go look at the Grand Canyon. And go to uh, Wyoming and see Grand Teton National Park in Yellowstone and see the geysers. I gave you this world. You didn't enjoy it. There's so much beauty in this world. We're obligated to enjoy that. God is going to hold us accountable. Huh? I put you in this world and you didn't benefit from it? Terrible thing. And by the way, we are supposed to derive a closeness to Hashem through it. I remember last year, we took a fa- our family trip. We went uh, in the summer, we went to um, Arizona, went to Grand Canyon. We went to a bunch of uh, magnificent places. And when we, so when we got to the Grand Canyon and we looked, it was almost sunset. And it's, it's breathtaking. My son, at the time, he was 19 years old. He turned to me and he said, Abba, how is it possible for anybody to say that there isn't a God? Look at this and tell me there's no God. I mean, it's awe-inspiring. You look, it's breathtaking. The magnificence, the grandeur of the Almighty's creation. Take a moment and enjoy it. Connect, elevate your relationship with God. That's what we're here for. Not to say, you know what? Oh, I have to sit in the study hall and study Torah all day. There's a time for that too. But there's also a time to go enjoy the world and to see Hashem's creation. Not only to see God's creation through the learning of the Torah, but to go experience it. Someone who doesn't delve into the real pleasures of this world, the godly pleasures of this world, because his soul is so thirsty and yearning for a pleasure, he may be like someone who's in the desert, very thirsty. Will take any water. Just give me water. I just need water. I need something to drink. But what's if I tell you it's poisonous water? I don't care. I need to drink it. The the parable here is that these fake pleasures, 
Now they're essential, right? Food is essential. Sleep is essential. But get, getting carried away by it is very dangerous. Where food becomes the essence of our lives, where these fleeting pleasures become the essence of our existence, that's very dangerous. Because then we can get our soul addicted to fake pleasures instead of us investing fully and completely in authentic pleasures, we're ready to sell ourselves to counterfeit pleasures. There is a special desire and temptation, a yetzahara, therefore, there are many who think and come to this mistaken conclusion that pleasure is sinful. And that pleasure is not good for you. Why? It all comes from a mistake not knowing the importance of authentic pleasure and not having experienced it properly. Ki hara yodea, the yetzahara knows she'im adam yelam ot The yetzahara knows that if someone avoids and pushes off, pushes away authentic pleasures, it'll be very difficult for someone like that to grow spiritually. In order for us to grow spiritually, we have to have a flavor and a taste in our relationship with God. And if we don't have that flavor and that joy, we don't have that good taste, we're going to push it off. Say, you know what? I don't need that, or I don't want that, or heaven forbid, push off that relationship with Hashem because I didn't feel the the excitement. I didn't feel the enjoyment. Now we understand what we said at the beginning of class when we said the prayer. Make it sweet. We want to have that sweetness because when we have that sweetness, we continue to come back for more. We say, Hashem, I want more. And that's we get to a level of dvekut, which is to cleave to Hashem and not let go because of that sweetness. But that's our job. Our job is to invest every single day in the sweetness of our relationship with God. But the truth is, that on the contrary, the true service of Hashem is only with pleasure. Okay? The service, true service of Hashem can only come through pleasure. Now again, we're going to have to define what pleasure is. Authentic pleasure versus counterfeit pleasure. Look, look at the, you look at the commandment to love Hashem. How can you love Hashem? How can we love Hashem? There's a special commandment to love Hashem. How? Well, we have to invest in it. We have to look into what are the uh, the keys to loving Hashem. Do the, do the homework. And we do that in all of our classes. That's one of the things we talk about in great length is how to invest in our relationship with Hashem. The ultimate pleasure in this world, five-star pleasure in this world, is closeness with Hashem. There is no one on planet Earth who is happier than someone who not only believes in Hashem, but completely trusts in Hashem. No human being is happier than someone like that. They have nothing to fear. They have nothing to worry. They are all happiness. Such a person can cleave to Hashem, take it to the next level. Why? They have a problem with the, they got a parking ticket. Hashem, I love you. Nothing worries them. I know, Hashem, you're guiding me. I know, Hashem, you're there with me. I know, Hashem, that every single step of the way, you're right beside me. We say, the 
one who trusts in Hashem, chesed, kindness, is all around him. Even that traffic ticket is a sign of kindness from Hashem. Hashem is giving you another opportunity to overcome your instinctive fear and put your reliance on him. So you hurt yourself. You get a little pain in your arm. You have a headache. We have to understand that these are messages from Hashem. And the more one is cognizant, one is conscious of the relationship they have with Hashem, the less worry. I believe, I believe firmly. You know, we say every morning, we say an amazing prayer of Adon Olam, master of the universe. You know why we say that? It's an amazing prayer. The first person to say and call and recognize God as Adon, as master, was Abraham. What prayer is Abraham's prayer? The morning prayer. So we say, Adon Olam, master of the universe, every morning. The last phrase, Hashem li velo ira. Hashem is with me, I shall not fear. Do you know the best remedy to anxiety, to stress? Do you want to live a stress-free life? Hashem li velo ira. Put my reliance on Hashem and have nothing to fear. Nothing whatsoever. Nothing to worry about. You're worried about something. Put your reliance on Hashem and He's got you covered. Hashem li velo ira. Any stress that a person feels, you can track down immediately to a lack of reliance on, on, on Hashem. As soon as we're able to take it all in and say to ourselves, stop what's going on, stop the chaos of this world, and say, Hashem, I know that everything is in your hands. I'm going to put forward my effort, not, and knowing fully that my effort doesn't result in anything. I have to put forward my effort, make the phone call, send the letter, do put forward your effort. And Hashem will succeed your way. Hashem li lo irab, nothing to worry. Hashem, I know it's in your hands. I know you've got this. The greatest pleasure on planet Earth is a closeness and a relationship with Hashem. There's nothing more powerful, nothing more freeing, nothing more enjoyable than having a closeness with Hashem. And true, authentic pleasure is holy and elevated. Because that, that pleasure will result in one having a cleaving to Hashem and a connection constantly with Hashem. Because anything that a person has pleasure from, he becomes connected to and comes for more. That's why our sages tell us, one of the great sages said, he says, more than I pray for anything, I pray that the pleasures, the lowly pleasures of this world, that they don't enter my body. Why? Because it's addictive. I'm going to taste a good drink and I'm going to become addicted to that drink. I'm going to taste the good food and I'm going to become addicted to that pleasure. I'm going to do something. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to want more. If there are holy pleasures, if there are first class pleasures, that's a very good thing because it only brings us closer to Hashem. But if they're earthly pleasures, if they're the physical type of pleasures, they have a danger of pulling me away. And this is the introduction to a world of holiness. A world of holiness is a world of pleasure. The Ramchal, the beginning of the Mesilati Sharim, 
The first chapter talks about our investment in pleasure. Judaism is all about pleasure. Every mitzvah we have is about pleasure. Think of Pesach, Passover. You know, it's like there are many, many laws that need to be observed to properly experience Shabbos. There are many laws that need to be observed in order to properly experience Pesach, the holiday of Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, all of the holidays. There are many laws that need to be observed in order to enjoy that holiday. So we could say, wow, it's so restrictive. Or we can realize that, you know, you want to fly a plane? There are a lot of laws about how to fly a plane. There are a lot of buttons get in there like, oh, my goodness, this is so overwhelming, right? But if you want to have the pleasure of in three hours being in New York from Houston, that's what it's going to take. If we want to properly be synchronized for the real spiritual pleasures of Shabbos, yeah, there's going to be a lot of training to get into the right zone to perfectly enjoy Shabbos. By the way, Shabbos is the greatest pleasure of all. Shabbos, we do nothing creative on Shabbos. No creative labor. Now, people mistake it and say, oh, you're not allowed to work on Shabbos. That's not true. It's not true. We host many people in our house for Shabbos. We have many people who can serve. We've had dozens and dozens of people eat in our home and join us for the Shabbos meal. And you know what? That's a lot of work. But that's not prohibited. Moving the chairs and the tables and serving the food, it's a lot of work. Not prohibited. Flicking on a light switch, prohibited. Why? Because one is creative labor. You're creating light. You create, right? It's why we don't cook food on Shabbos. You can't, you're creating something. God says, create six days a week. On the seventh day, just exist with me. Spend time with me. It's like, imagine you go on vacation with your spouse. What's the point of that vacation? Do nothing. That's what it is. Do nothing. Just let's spend time together. Let's focus on each other. We're so busy being focused on work. We're busy focused on community. We're busy focused on so many different things. Let's just focus on each other. That's every Shabbos. Hashem says, you're doing great work. You're doing magnificent things. You're doing work in the community. You're doing work in your, in your everywhere. You're volunteering. You're doing great things. Shabbos, let's bring it back together. Let's just spend time, just the, the two of us. You and Hashem. That's it. Nothing else. And you know what? Buy the best foods possible. Buy the best drinks possible. Wear your finest clothes. Prepare everything so that this time is just perfect. Serene. That's what Shabbos is about. Shabbos is not about having things to do, nothing to do. Just bask in the relationship with Hashem. Yeah, so there are a lot of things that need to happen, a lot of things, a lot of restrictions, so to speak, to get you in the right frame of mind of being able to experience that pleasure. That's what we're looking for. We don't want cheap pleasures. Cheap pleasures cost you 50 cents at the candy store. Yeah, you got your candy, you got your fix, and now what? Can that carry you through challenges in life? No. Well, a relationship with Hashem does. The highest form of pleasure, and it carries you through any challenge in life. So, I know this may be not the ordinary Sunday morning class, but I think it's a very important and fundamental teaching that will hopefully give us the pathway to investing in the authentic pleasures that God wants us 
in his close proximity, in, his clo- in a close relationship with Hashem, where we don't take the physical pleasures and allow that to please our, our physical body, but rather take the highest form of pleasure and let that feed our spiritual body. And not get carried away, not confuse the two. Yes, it's good to have good food. Yes, it's good to enjoy it. But use it as a tool to elevate, not as a tool to pull us down. And we see this in the world we're in today. There's terrible addiction. People are thirsty. People are desiring a connection. People are yearning for closeness with the Almighty. And they're looking in all the wrong places. A bottle of scotch is not going to do it. Yeah, you take a little shot. That's nice. You know, I spoke to someone who owns a winery. He owns a, a vine- many vineyards in Israel. And he, uh, he, he produces wine as well, along, along, along with many other products. So I said, do you like wine? He says, I like to taste wine. I thought of such a special answer. Many people like to drink wine. Well, I like the taste of wine, right? It's very different. I like to taste it. Get the pleasure of the taste, but it doesn't have to overtake my entire existence where suddenly I don't even know what way is right, one way is, is left. I think in an unscientific survey, the people who are drunk least are wine connoisseurs. Because they know that if they drink too much, they lose it all. I'm not going to be present. So they know just the right amount to enjoy their wine. Not to fall into the trap of drinking too much and then losing it. It's a fine line how to enjoy the physical pleasures of this world without it overtaking us. To eat, it's very important. We need it. But sometimes our Yetzahara, our evil inclination, can push us in and say, eat a little bit more. It's so good. Just eat more. Just eat more. And we know how unhealthy that can be. So while we need it, we need to have food and drink. It's a very big, a very tricky art to have the right Uh, balance in spiritual pleasures there also needs to be a balance a person can't do it overnight it takes time one small step after another small step after another small step but to invest in authentic pleasures and not allow ourselves to suffice and be comfortable with fleeting physical materialistic pleasures as a replacement for our spiritual pleasures. So my dear friends, we're going to stop here for this week and God willing next week, we'll prepare uh, for the next steps. I think there, there are a couple more parts here of taking this spiritual pursuit for pleasure to help us elevate our relationship with Hashem. Any questions?